education. That's just window dressing. If you get out of here with, you know, if, if they not elect you as possum queen and you get a parade and a crown and a, a dozen red roses and you get out of here with an education, your time here has been worthless. It won't help you one bit. But anyway, that's another topic for another day. So learn. Anyway, um, well, uh, Woodrow Wilson signed this treaty. Uh, he, I think he knew it was a, a terrible treaty. I think they did the very best that they could, but it was an impossible task, as I said to you uh, yesterday. Uh, and then Wilson uh, had to bring it back to the United States, uh, negotiates it, negotiates and works, writes this treaty for in six months, and then he has to bring it back to the United States. The president of the United States, as you know, can sign any treaty anywhere that he wants to, but that doesn't make the treaty effective. He's got to bring it back, and it's got to be approved by the Senate, not the House, but the Senate. Uh, there are a lot of things the House can do that the Senate can't, but treaties are the domain of the U.S. Senate, and it's a pretty steep curve. You don't see very many presidents sign very many treaties because they're enormously hard to get through the Congress. It takes a two-thirds of the Senate, and it takes a two-thirds vote, and the Senate rarely, if ever, uh, does that. Okay, so, um, well, you know, I think the last time there was a treaty, Barack Obama was president. I think that's how rare they were. Um, have we talked about this man, Henry Cabot Lodge? Have we talked about him? Okay, I'm just trying to find my way. So anyway, Wilson comes home with the treaty, and he's got to get it through the Senate. Well, get this down. He's got a couple of problems. Number one, the Republicans were in control of the Senate, the Republican Party. Wilson's a Democrat. This man right here getting down, Henry Cabot Lodge of Massachusetts. He was the leader of the Republican Party in the Senate. He's the Senate Majority Leader. And for Wilson to get that treaty written, or through the Senate, he has to approve it. If he says to the Republicans, vote for this, they probably will. But if he says don't, they won't. Uh, Lodge, uh, you know, Wilson had a PhD, a doctor's degree in political science. He really understood how government worked, and so did Lodge. Lodge had a PhD in political science. So in this battle coming up over the Treaty of Versailles, it's going to be Dr. Thomas Woodrow Wilson versus Dr. Henry Cabot Lodge. And Lodge, you know, is in many ways holding all the cards because I repeat again, uh, the Republicans are a majority in the Senate. And by the way, many of them, including Lodge, hates, uh, hates uh, Wilson. In fact, this is Teddy Roosevelt's best friend right there. Teddy Roosevelt just died. <coughs> T.R. hated Wilson, and Wilson hated T.R. And uh, Lodge toward Wilson is the same way. But you know, the way the story is usually told about the Treaty of Versailles in simple time history, it's that Wilson was a Democrat and he negotiated this treaty and then he brought it back. And Henry Cabot Lodge, who was a Republican, the Republicans hated Wilson so badly that they voted the treaty down. Uh, just on that basis. We don't like Wilson. We don't care what the treaty says. We're going to vote against it because it's Wilson's treaty. And that's simply not true. The Republicans got this down and then I'm running out of markers today. I can't. Mr. Hale, can you see that? Yes. I'm straight again. That's good. Obstructionist, okay? The Republicans got this down. They're accused of being obstructions. An obstructionist is someone who's against something just to be against it. I can give you a quick illustration. When we do this homecoming float building and we're trying to decide a theme, I've sat through 42 years of this stuff. When they're trying to decide a theme, somebody will get up and say, well, you know, the theme ought to be whip the wildcats. And some other guy will stand up over that with the Wildcats, what we've had in the last five years. We'll never win the flood. Nah, that's a lousy idea. Well, do you have any ideas? No, I don't have any, but I'm sure against that. He'll say that. Well, any other suggestions? Well, stomp the Wildcats. And the same guy will jump up and say, what do you mean stomp the Wildcats? That's worse than whip the Wildcats. We'll lose. We'll lose. we got to come. Well, do you have any ideas? No, I don't have any ideas. I'm just against that. That's what an obstructionist is. An obstructionist, you all dealt with people like that. An obstructionist is someone who is against something just to be against it. And that's what the Republicans are accused of. And I want you to tell you that's not true. Get this down. That's not true. The Republicans, in fact, <clears throat> would have passed this treaty. The Republicans aren't, now listen to what I'm going to say, the Republicans aren't necessarily, there are some who are against it regardless because it was Woodrow Wilson. There are some Republican obstructions, but the majority of Republicans say, look, we'll give Wilson his treaty. 
We just want to make a few changes. There was one big change they wanted to make, and I know this is a broad, open-ended question, uh, but I'll see if anybody could come up with it. Actually, somebody did come pretty close this morning. Uh, what is it about the Treaty of Versailles that these Republicans didn't like? And they said, we'll just change that thing. And it was a pretty big thing, but we'll just change that thing. And then Wilson can get 90% of what he wants. That's a pretty good deal. That's a pretty good deal. If you're ever in negotiations and somebody says, hey, I'll give you 90% of what you want, but I'm going to change this, what should you do? Take it and come back and get the other 10% later. You know, when Lyndon Johnson was president, he was in negotiations one time, and he got about half of the bill he wanted, and he said, okay, I'll do it. And one of his young aides said to him, Mr. President, why did you agree to that? Why did you agree to him? And he said, half a loaf is better than none. Half a loaf is better than none. And then later he came back and got the rest of it. That's, that's sensible negotiation. The other type of negotiation is to dig your heels in and say, it's my way or the highway. You don't get much usually that way. Once in a while you do, but not very often. So what do you think the Republicans, about the Treaty of Versailles, what do you think the Republicans objected to? The main thing. They objected to more than one thing. I'm you know, just hitting the high points here. What do you think they objected to? What about, that's true. Not join. I think they would have joined the League of Nations except for one thing. What about the League of Nations? What one thing, major thing, did they not like about the League of Nations? It's mainly in Europe. Mostly. Well, it's European. That's true. Anything else? Britain's in. I wasn't thinking about that, but that would constantly tie us to Europe, and a lot of people didn't like that. What? Great Britain's in the League of Nations. Great Britain, what? Is in the League of Nations. Well, yeah, but they're there now. I think they can live in Great Britain. How was the League of Nations supposed to work? If one nation got aggressive, all of us, all of them, went to war. If you were in the League, you had to go to war. What does our rule book here say about the United States going to war? Who has, who's this say has the power to declare war? Nope, 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 nope. The Founding Fathers would have never given that much power to one person. One of the reasons our Constitution is there's a separation of powers. What? Congress. Only the Congress of the United States can declare war. When's the last time they did that? That's right. So that means what you're saying, if I'm correct, what you're saying is, is that every war that we've fought since World War II has been an undeclared war. It's been fought by, is that what you're saying? Well, you're absolutely right. And by the way, how many of those have we won? None. I think the founding fathers maybe knew what they were doing. If the people have to go die in a war, only the representatives of the people, that's the Congress, can send them to war. Pretty good notion. And we've abandoned that since the end of World War II. And it's been dealt this country nothing but grief. Nothing but grief. But let me ask you this. If we're in the League of Nations and France and England go to war, say England is the aggressive, aggressive. they want to attack France. Who gets to decide whether or not the United States goes to war? France. Who? France. Well, not just France. What? The League of Nations. The League of Nations. You understand that? You understand that? If we join the League of Nations and the League of Nations go to war, we've got to go to war. You understand that? You know, what I mean? you know it's insane. If the Congress declares war, it says if the, if you're in the League and the League goes to war, you've got to go. Right? And so here's what the Republicans said. They said, we just want to get this down. They said, we want to, we don't want to beat the, defeat the treaty. <coughs> Pardon me. We just want to amend it. Amend means to change. And they didn't want to change all that much. They said, we'll join the league, but we just want to put a little thing in there that says, if the league goes to war, the Congress of the United States reserves the right to declare war and send Americans to war. You understand that? And that's what they wanted to change. And then Wilson would get the rest of his treaty. What did Wilson say? Yes. No. Why? You know Woodrow Wilson. I've told you about him. Why? Yeah. Stubborn. My way or the highway. You're going to do it my way or we're not going to dance. And so Wilson sends it up there to the Congress and Henry Cabot Lodge and the Republicans say, we're going to change. They start amending the treaty. And so then guess what? Woodrow Wilson takes a play 
out of the playbook of his arch enemy, Theodore Roosevelt. You know, Theodore Roosevelt said, if I want to get something done and the Congress won't do it, how do I get it done? Bully pull, excellent. Bull, I, and that means I go over the heads of the Congress directly to the people. And the people will put pressure on the Congress and the Congress will do what I want to do. I'm going to go around the Congress. And that's what Woodrow Wilson did. Got that down. He said, I'm going to go around the Congress. He said, I'm going to go on a speaking tour of the country. And he did. Get this down. I'm going to go on a speaking tour of the country. And so he got on a train. And by the way, he was worn out. He had been arguing with Clemenceau for six months. And by the way, Woodrow Wilson never had good health in his life. He never had good health. But he gets on the back of this train. He's going to travel over 8,000 miles by train. He's going to make 40 speeches. And his theme is the same in every speech. Get this down. This is what he tells the American people. This treaty must be passed as it is. It must be passed as it is. If this treaty... If the Congress will not pass this treaty as it is, then your sons died in vain. Your sons' deaths are meaningless. Wilson said if they don't pay, if they change one comma in this treaty, we will lose the peace after winning the war. He called the treaty. Get listen to this. He called the treaty. He said this treaty is the work of the hand of God. I mean, literally, he's saying God wrote this treaty. And, of course, he begins to believe in the middle of this tour, he begins to believe that he was God's instrument to get this treaty passed and to save the world from war. Well, at Pueblo, Colorado, on September 25th, 1919, he made a speech. You know, we don't like for our presidents to cry after some thug broke into the Sandy Hook Elementary School a few years ago with an automatic weapon and slaughtered all these little kids, and a couple of the teachers and maybe a parent or so, I don't know. But it was a horrible, horrible thing to see their little faces, these little kids just starting out in life. Their biggest worry ought to be if there's sand enough in the sandbox. Murdered, and President Obama spoke to the nation. And that's what presidents do when a tragedy happens. And of course, after he spoke, or as he was speaking about it, he just, he didn't break down and boo-hoo. He just wiped a tear. He was criticized for that. When Ronald Reagan was president, I was talking about this yesterday in my six-hour class. We sent 200, well, several hundred Marines to Beirut, Lebanon to combat terrorism. This was back in the 80s. And they put them up in a Paul hotel and a terrorist got in a small car, crammed it so full of explosives, his uh, fellows had to shut him down in it and then crashed through the barrier, went right in the lobby of that hotel, touched two wires together, and blew that hotel up and killed 260 Marines in their sleep. And they all came back in, in flag-draped draped coffins. And President and Mrs. Reagan went down to Andrews Air Force Base to show their respects. So and they were walking, and there were 260 young Americans in flag-draped coffins. And when Reagan gets to the end, he flicked the tear away. Didn't break down a boo-hoo-hoo, but he flicked the tear, and he was criticized for that. We've got this notion that our presidents ought to be superhuman, that they shouldn't have real human emotions on things like that. And we don't like to see a president cry. We just don't like it. <coughs> and Wilson, at this speech, when he, was, when he got up to give the speech, they had seated several uh, gold star mothers. What's a gold star mother? What is, if, you, if you're driving down the road and you see a white cloth, hanging in a window and it's got a gold star in the middle. Well, red, white, and blue cloth, and it's got a gold star in the middle of it. What does that mean about that family? They have a son who died in war. They have a son or a daughter who died in war. That's, what's, what's a blue star? What does that say about that family? They've got someone, they've got a son or a daughter, and there's someone in the family serving in the military. But gold star, those are people whose uh, relatives gave their lives. And here were all these mothers here, and Wilson stands up to speak, and I know what he's thinking. He looks and he said, all of those mothers lost children because I sent their sons to war, okay? And he starts making the speech, and get this down, uh, he broke down and wept. He got so emotional that he broke down and wept in public, and that made all the newspapers, and he was roundly criticized for that. After this, But he, he, he regains his composure, and he makes the speech, finishes the speech, and then he got on a train, 
And uh, he went uh, to his next speech. And they got out in the middle of Colorado, out in the middle, you know, there's nothing but wide open prairie and sagebrush and cactus and coyotes out there. And he, his arm starts hurting, his left arm starts hurting. And so he tells his secret service man, I want to stop the train and get out and just walk a little bit and get some fresh air. So they stopped this train out in the middle of nowhere. And Wilson gets out and he's walking with one of his secret service men. And the whole time he's rubbing his left arm. What was happening? Yeah, he was having a stroke, okay? Cousin of a heart attack. He wasn't really having a stroke, but he was really showing symptoms of it. And they put him back in the train car. They call his doctor. The doctor comes up, checks him out, and he says, clear all the tracks between Washington, D.C. and uh, Colorado. Uh, and that train roared back into Washington, D.C. He gets there with a team of doctors, and the doctors put him through all this physical examination, and they tell him, you're going to have to go to bed for two weeks. No treaty of Versailles, no politics, no president. You, if you don't rest, complete bed rest for two weeks, you're going to die, Mr. President. <coughs> and so... <clears throat> pardon me, Wilson pretty well obeyed the doctor. And the whole time that he's in bed, this big debate's going on down the street in the Congress over the Treaty of Versailles in the Senate. And by the way, he's the leader of the Democrat Party. If they, Wilson is. If, he ever, if the Democrat Party ever needed a leader, their leader, it was them. But he seems to be improving. And one morning, Mrs. Wilson is sitting on the side of the presidential bed and she's combing her hair, getting ready to get dressed. The president is in the bathroom, the presidential bathroom, I guess, and he's shaving, and all of a sudden she heard a thud, and she jumped up and went in, and he had suffered a massive stroke. He was blind in one eye. He was paralyzed in the left side of his body. He never regained use of the left side of his body, and he couldn't speak, and when she gets there, it's a miracle he didn't die. He was comatose. He, he didn't know he was in the world, uh, and so, you know, they you know, call in the doctors, and, uh, you know, eventually Wilson will regain uh, consciousness, okay, but while this debate's going on, uh, he's he's pretty much he's pretty much out of it. In fact, you know, you understand that the Constitution says that if a president becomes incapacitated, if he can't serve, you know, he's incapable. He was he was in a coma. You know, uh, the Congress can remove him from office, and then the vice president will become the president of the United States. And Henry Cabot Lodge here led a group of Republicans over to see Wilson just to kind of check on him. They're kind of looking. To, they're getting ready to remove him from office, uh, and they just want to make sure they've got a good case. Well, uh, by that time, Wilson had improved just a little bit, uh, and so, you know, he knows this Republican, the Republicans say, would we, like, we would like to just come over and see. He knew what they were coming over there for, uh, and so he, uh, you know, has his barber come in and give him a haircut. He gets a shave. He's all cleaned up. He's in a new set of pajamas, but in the anticipation of that, he started with his good hand. He started squeezing a rubber ball. Because with Henry Cap, you, you've ever shaken hands with somebody, it's like shaking hands with a dead fish. Hold your hand out. You've ever shaken hands with somebody that just goes like that? You know, it just makes me want to go, yeah. But Wilson wants a good, strong, because when Henry Cabot Lodge comes up to shake hands with him, he wants to prove, you know, I'm vital, I can be president of the United States. So he squeezes that ball, okay? And Lodge comes in, and he's a Lodge is a little scrawny guy, and he sticks out his little old hand, and Wilson just kind of crunches it, you know, and you know, Lodge here. And they talk for a while, and so they decide they're not going to try and get rid of Wilson after all. The attitude is, well, he'll be dead or out of office in a few months anyway, so we can live with that. Meanwhile, get this down. Meanwhile, the debate went on, and the Democrats, Wilson's own party, the Democrats come to Wilson, and they begged him. They said, Mr. President, just compromise a little bit. You can get everything you want, just a little bit, please, Mr. President. And Wilson said no. In fact, get this down. Wilson ordered the Democrats. Listen, get this down. Wilson ordered the Democrats, his own party, to vote against the Treaty of Versailles. And they did. He said, vote against Wilson's treaty. Vote against the Treaty of Versailles. And, Will and, and they did. And so when the final vote came, get this down. The Republicans, talk about odd an odd picture, the Republicans voted for the treaty and the Democrats all voted against it. A majority of senators voted for the treaty. But what's the problem? Why did the treaty fail? A majority of them voted for it. The, the Republicans were the majority and they all voted for it. The Democrats all voted against it. Why did the treaty fail? 
if a majority voted for it. Well, but they didn't make up all two of the thirds. Huh? They didn't make up the two thirds. They didn't get two thirds. Majority doesn't count when it requires a two thirds vote. Yeah. So Wilson and the Democrats killed the Treaty of Versailles. I want you to get this to understand this. We don't. We actually. So we never you got to get this. We never joined the. It's our idea. We never joined the League of Nations. And we have to sign a separate peace treaty with Germany. We don't sign. We don't sign a treaty with Germany until 1921. So technically, we're at war with Germany until 1921. And as I say, we never joined the League. Sixty other countries joined the League of Nations, and the League of Nations is going to last for 20 years until about until World War II breaks out. But uh, we never we never joined it. And so that'll take us. And by the way, Wilson, he left office in 1921, promising. He said. History will vindicate me. Write that word down. There's your word for this. What does vindicate mean? He said, history will vindicate me. What does that mean? Resurrect. I'm sorry? Resurrect. Well, in a sense, he said, he said, history will prove that I was right. History will prove that I was right. By the way, he left the White House in a wheelchair. He's an invalid for his last year and a half as president. There won't be another wheelchair in the White House until Franklin Roosevelt. When was the next wheelchair after Franklin Roosevelt? When, when was the next wheel? When, who's the next president? Was it? He wasn't in it all the time, but a lot of, some of the times he was in a wheelchair. Huh? Was it one of the Bushes? No, 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 no. One of the Bushes. John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy was a pretty sick little puppy. You know, the, the, the Kennedys portray this thing. They're always out on the beach throwing footballs and doing he was sick, sick, sick guy. Uh, he had to take steroids every day. Okay, he had his doctor who came in and gave him a steroid shot. And of course, that's uh, not known to the country, but you know, uh, if Lee Harvey Oswald hadn't killed him, he'd have probably died at a reasonably young age because steroids will foul up your system. It will cause your kidneys to rot, for example, excessive use of them. <coughs> but yeah, but look at him over there. He doesn't look like sick. He's sick. And he was in a wheelchair sometimes in the White House. Not all the time, but sometimes. Anyway, enough said about that. Well, that'll take us to the election of 1920. Get this down, the election of 1920. The election of 1920, very quickly. Well, by 1920, the American people were tired of Woodrow Wilson. The American people were tired of Woodrow Wilson. And they were tired of progressivism. Got this down. You remember that the progressive movement, this progressive liberal movement, this idea that we've got to save the world, it's our duty to go out and save the world, began in 1901 with Teddy Roosevelt, and it will end in 1921 when Woodrow Wilson leaves the White House. Get all this down. World War I killed it. Get this down. World War I killed the progressive era. You with me? Yes. World War I killed the progressive era. And by the way, the progressives are going to come back in about 15 years, but for now, they're dead. And the country, get this down, beginning in 1920, will elect. So they, you know, these you have you have 20 years of progressive liberals. But all that's going to change in 1920 because the American people. Tired of world saving. And by the way, World War I has become very unpopular by 1920. The American people, listen, the American people are saying, we got tricked into that war. The French and the British tricked us in. And never again are we going to fall for that. We're never going to get tied up in one of Europe, Europe's messes again. We got tricked in. We loaned them all that money. They haven't even paid us that money back. The Germans are paying us, but our allies aren't. And that was true, by the way, the money part not being tricked into it. So never again. So in 1920, get this down, the, the United States takes a conservative turn. And we return to isolationism. Isolationism. Woodrow Wilson had been an internationalist. Wilson had been, you know, he believed the United States should take a role 
should be involved all over the world. Let me ask you something, Mr. Chapman. Would Woodrow Wilson be uh, in favor of the recent war that we fought in Afghanistan? Yeah. Yeah. What, 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 why did we say, this is what we said, why did we say we were going to Afghanistan to lose 6,000 people that looked like you, not be you. you. Remember, you fight wars. I know. They, they won't call me until the Russians reach the Red River down by Durant. Then I might move to Kansas. But anyway, you, know, you people are the ones that are cannon fodder. You fight the wars. So why did we say it was worth your life to go over there? Because a lot of people are just like you. You just spread democracy. Huh? To make them a democracy. To, does that sound like make the world safe for democracy? Yeah. Does that sound like Woodrow Wilson? If you don't think Woodrow Wilson, listen, he's not dead. Well, he's dead. He's not walking around. But Woodrow Wilson. Has got his fingerprints, his hands all over our foreign policy. Because Woodrow Wilson believed we ought to be internationalists. We ought to be involved all over the world. By the way, are we involved all over the world today? Yeah. How many? You know what? <coughs> well, just a minute. So, anyway, the American people, we embrace isolationism in 1920. And how long will we be isolationists? You know, the attitude was, look, the attitude was, look, we started, this, this country started in 1789, and up until 1917, minus the Spanish-American War, but it only lasted 100 days, minus the Spanish, we had been isolationists. We kept to ourselves. We didn't go around the world looking for trouble. But now, you know, uh, in 1917, we did, and it turned into a mess. And so the American people said, we're going back in 1920. They said, we're going back to isolationism. And we did. And by the way, get this. It's the last, starting in 1921, it's the last great period of isolationism in American history. How long? Now my question is, how long did isolationism last? Until World War II. Yeah, until which day? I want the day and the month and the year. What blasted us out of isolation? We were isolationists for 20 years. Look. We said, you know, listen, you think about Vladimir Putin invading the Ukraine and we won't commit troops, and I'm not saying we should. I'm just saying we won't do it. Look, we watched Hitler take all of Europe, not just Ukraine. We watched Japan take all of China and kill 15 million Chinese. And we didn't like it. And we said, ooh, that's bad. We wish it wasn't happening. But we didn't send one troop. What event blasted us out of isolationism forever? Pearl, and when was that? December 7th. Write that down, December 7th, 1941. So for 20 years, we're isolationists. Do you know what? On the, how many, to show you, to illustrate my point, how many military bases did we have overseas on December 6th, the day before Pearl Harbor? How many military bases did we have overseas? Uh, on December 6, 1941, do you reckon? Guess. <coughs> Any guesses? One. One? No, we have a few more than that. That's an educated guess. Any guesses? Just pick a number. How many? Ten? No, that's not it. But you're close. <coughs> well, you're really close. Thirteen. How much? Thirteen. Now you're cold. You're hot, you're cold. 16 military bases. You don't have to write that down. I'm trying to illustrate the point. All over the world, we had 16 military bases. How many do we have today? And remember, there are 210 countries in the world, so how many military bases do we have today? Couple hundred. How much? Couple hundred. Come on. There are only 210 countries in the world. So okay, you're, you're staying without a couple of hundred? 175. How much? 175. Let's try, oh, let me see, 800. <laughs> Have we become internationalists? Yes. Is Woodrow Wilson up in heaven going? <laughs> yeah. That's what he wanted. And that's what he got. He didn't get his League of Nations, but what do we have sitting in New York City today? The United Nations. That's just the first cousin to the League of Nations. Woodrow Wilson got everything he wanted. That's why it's so important for you to know about it, because you people are going to be making the decisions for this big, dumb, happy republic we live in. You're going to do it. And you ought to have a little background to make those weighty decisions. 
Anyway, history helps you make wise decisions in your personal and national life. Anyway, so the Republicans got this down. In 1920, knew they were going to win. They knew that the people were tired of Woodrow Wilson. They knew that they were tired of saving the world. Everybody just wants to come home to rest. And so they nominated a man named Warren, or, or the Republicans nominated, and we'll talk more about this later, but a man named Warren G. Harding. Uh, and his campaign slogan was back to normalcy. Write that down. We're going to talk about all this in greater detail, but I'm just trying to make a point today. Back to normalcy. Normalcy is not even a word. Harding said that in a speech, and the Democrats laughed at him and said, what a dummy these Republicans have nominated. This guy doesn't even have a proper command of the English language, and he wants to be president of the United States. There's no such word as normalcy. But the Republicans are so sure that... The country is so tired of the Treaty of Versailles and Woodrow Wilson and the League of Nations in World War I, they know they're going to win. So they took that word, it's not even a word, and they made it part of their campaign slogan. Back to normalcy. What was Hardy saying? If you elect me, I'm going to do what? Bring back class nationalism. Well, yes, but he's going to, I'm going to take you back to win. Back to win. After huh? World War I? After World War I? Before, when before world, I'm going to take this country back to the way it was before World War One ruined everything, and the American people elected him. Get this down. We'll talk more about the election, but the American people elected him. Look, the 1920s. Get this down. Is a conservative Republican decade. You've got three Republicans. It's called the Republican ascendancy. Ascend means to rise. So the Republicans rise to power in the 1920s. The progressive liberals are out and the conservative Republicans are in. And here are the three Republican presidents of the 1920s. Warren G. Harding is the first one. Warren G. Harding is the first one. Uh, he served from 1921. He dies in 1923. And then this man writing down Calvin Coolidge and put a big star by Calvin Coolidge's name. Calvin Coolidge serves from 1923 until 1929. Put a big star by Calvin Coolidge's name uh, because he's the president for most of the 1920s. Get this down. And the country under him pros prospered as it never had before. You got it? Yes. And then in 1929, this man, Herbert Hoover, we've talked about him before. Do you remember him? What was he? 1929 until 1933. He had excellent. He was the remember we saved food in World War One. He's the food administrator. Well, in 1929, he's elected president. And get this down. He had been in office six months, and the worst depression in history hit. He's the guy sitting in the office when the depression hit. And people have said in, in simple time history, they say, well, you know, here's all you need to know about the depression. Herbert Hoover was elected president, he caused the depression. And then when 1933, we elected God loving Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He came along with the New Deal and he ended the Depression. And now we're going to go on to the 50s or something. All that's untrue, except that we elected Herbert Hoover and Frank. Listen, presidents don't cause depressions. People are criticizing Joe Biden right now about the high inflation rate and gasoline prices and on and on. Presidents have very little to do with all that. Very little. To, there were all sorts of factors that caused the inflation rate. I'm not an advocate of inflation. I hope they get it under control. But I'll tell you what, if they, if, they, if they say, well, the government should do something, if the government gets inflation under control, your interest rates are going to go through the roof. You can pay high interest rates on the next car you buy, or you can have inflation. You know, it's, it pretty much works that way. But presidents, don't, and by the way, presidents don't cause depressions. My dad was 15 years old in 1929 when the depression hit. He lived every rotten year of it. And uh, if he were here, if I could clap my hands and bring him back and he was standing there, and I just said to you that Herbert Hoover didn't cause the Depression. He would point at me and say, that guy right there, don't listen to anything he said. I lived through the Depression. He didn't. He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Hoover caused the Depression. And he would also tell you, Franklin Roosevelt did the Depression. And I'm telling you, he didn't. And I used to come home from OU and I'd come and talk about, and my dad just shake his head and said, you and those idiot professors, that you don't know what the hell you're talking about. I was in the Depression. I was in World War II. You all are a bunch of idiots, okay? Just read a bunch of books and believe everything. Yeah, that's what he would say. But Franklin Roosevelt didn't end the Depression. 
Frank and Roosevelt had a program. I want to hold you over just a little bit today. Frank and Roosevelt had a program called the New Deal, right? People say, oh, the New Deal didn't know the New Deal. Didn't, didn't, didn't. The New Deal just created jobs for people so they could eat. The post office down here, there's a granite thing, right? In the, or no, a marble thing, a white marble thing in the front. It has WPA, that's Work Progress Administration. I think it was built in 1939 during the Depression. The armory where you build your floats, it has on the side 1936 WPA. That's Works Progress Administration. That's one of the programs that Roosevelt started in his New Deal to give people the ability to eat. Not ending the Depression. You ever been to Holden Bill? Wait, they got that Jinx. The Jinx football stadium was built during the Great Depression, part of the WPA. You ever been to Okima and played in what they call the Pecan Bowl? It's really odd. They've got a football, they've got a football field and a baseball field in the same, same stadium. You know what that and it's and it's brown rock, just like that um, armory. You ever see anything you see built out of brown rock, it goes back to the Great Depression. You know what they did with that? And they call it the pecan bowl up there. You know what they did with you know what the pecan bowl was here in World War II? They kept German prisoners of war in there. It was a prison camp. The Okima football and baseball thing was a prison camp. By the way, we had some right here. They say when the lake goes down up here where North Fork Town was before the World War II, that you can see the, the, the foundations of barracks that they used to keep German prisoners of war in, right here in Nicotash County. And if you were a farmer and you wanted to go and lease one, they can give you 15 Germans to go and get your crop in. You know, you had to bring them back at night. Somebody said, well, gee, wouldn't they run away? In Oklahoma, where are they going to go, for God's sake? They're right in the middle of the country. What are you going to do? Go to Tulsa and catch a flight to Miami and then catch a cruise ship out? No. <clears throat> but none of that ended the Depression. Franklin Roosevelt didn't end the Depression. What ended the Great Depression? Yeah, I want the specific day. You're right. What? What'd you say? Write that down. So you've already done it. Right there. That day, the Depression is. When the first Japanese bomb hit the first deck of the American ship of an American ship in Honolulu, Hawaii, Pearl Harbor, the Depression was over. The Depression was over. So anyway. Uh, we'll take it up there come tomorrow.